Why, good morning and welcome. I thought we were going to have a Sunday morning together where it was going to be raining and storming, but the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful Lord's Day, and we're glad that you're here to share the, that Lord's Day with us. If you're here in the sanctuary, we want to welcome you. For those of you that may be outside enjoying this spring morning in your car listening on the radio, we welcome you. And to those of you joining us later on at home on Sunshine TV, we're delighted to have you as well. We're going to invite you to get a bulletin for this service if you would like to have one. If you're here in the sanctuary, they're available in the back on the uh, music stands. And if you uh, prefer to have one through your phone or through your tablet, you can download it from the website at www.enolacog.com. And that's available to anyone, anywhere. In the back of your bulletin, there are some uh, announcements that we'd like to draw to your attention. The first one is spread the word around to the youth that signed up for it. They have their spring fun day and lunch here at the church today at 12 noon. Today at 7 p.m. we're going to have our prayer service here in the sanctuary. And on Tuesday we have ladies Bible study in the morning at 10. And then in the evening some teams are meeting, builders, navigators, and connectors. The first two of those at 6 and the last one, the connectors, at 7 p.m. Wednesday is 412 Youth Group and Adult Bible Study. Youth down in the Fellowship Hall and adult, adult Bible Study, excuse me, will be back in room number four. And that can also be watched online, at, either on Facebook Live or later on there's a recording that will be posted to Sunshine TV. Men, your breakfast is this Saturday at 8 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, so come on out for a great breakfast. Next Sunday we anticipate um, pretty much a regular Lord's Day. A couple of other things to make you aware of, and we announced this last week, but we want to make sure everybody understood the uh, announcement. That is this, that the administrative board has moved that beginning May 1st, the ropes in the center section of the sanctuary will be removed. The main reason for that is because of the increasing attendance at our 1030 service, and we want to make room for families and larger groups of people to be able to do that. However, the side sections will still be roped off if you come to that service for physical distancing purposes, you can stay over there or back in the living room or out in the lobby or simply come to this uh, early 8 o'clock service if you prefer that as well. So we just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. Also today is Teacher Appreciation Sunday. We want to say thank you to each and every one of you that has served as a teacher in various capacities here in the life of the church. Thank you. We're not going to do anything formal uh, where we get everybody to come up here and make a big deal out of it that way. Instead, we're going to send you off with a nice gift. If you would find your way after this service out into the living room, there's a table out there that you'll find with a bunch of uh, bags with the church insignia on it and your name on it with a gift in there for you. We would like you to take that if you're here today with you. And uh, that is our way of saying thank you so much for being a teacher, for serving in God's church in that capacity. I believe those are all the announcements for this morning, so we're very pleased at this time to begin our worship service by listening to our prelude by Nick Melton.
Thank you, Nick, for sharing that very fine prelude with us. A very fine way to begin our worship time together this morning. I'm going to invite you now to listen to the words of the call to worship. It comes to us today from Psalm 98, verses 1 through 3. The psalmist writes, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Glory be to the Father. God, we're grateful for a beautiful spring morning to gather together in Jesus' name. But so much more are we grateful that you are our God. We pray, Lord, that this day would be one where we would focus on you as the Lord's day. And that in this hour that we're together, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Because truly, you do deserve it. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let's sing together number 12. Praise him, praise him.
For our offering moment this morning, we'll be sharing from Psalm 54, verses 6 through 7, where it reads, With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Thank you so much for supporting the ministry here at ECOG. For those of you that brought tithes and offerings today to the church, you know where they can be deposited in the offering box in the back of the sanctuary or the metal collection boxes at the entrances. And for those of you that may be in the parking lot or at home, we know that you have been generous as well, and thank you so much for your generosity, dropping offerings off here at the church from time to time, mailing them in, setting up your bill payer. People have been very creative, and God has been good. The ministry continues on. Just a sign to us that um, Jesus said gates of hell are not going to prevail against his church, and uh, God's not going to let the offering come in the way either. He's been working through the generosity of his people. Let's take the opportunity now to go to the Lord in prayer and give thanks for the generosity of his people and for God's goodness to us. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for you being such a great and good God that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights. And we thank you also, Lord, for the faithfulness and generosity of your people. We pray, Lord, that as the gifts and tithes and offerings are collected here, even though you don't need them, you use them in ways, Heavenly Father, that people are ministered to. The gospel is put forth, needs are met, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that there would be tremendous kingdom impact because we were obedient to give to the work of your ministry. Bless the gift and the giver and all that we do for your honor and glory, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer hymn this morning is number 560, More About Jesus.
And now it is time for us to take the opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer. As always, we have a lot to pray for, so let's get to it as the family of God. Let's pray together. Will you pray with me now? God, what an honor it is to gather together as your people, to look to you in prayer today, thanking you that we can trust you, that you are good to us, that yes, you allow the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, but Lord, the, the grace and the mercy that you show to us, it's unbelievable. We give you thanks for the good God that you are. God, we freely admit that we have not treated you like we should as your children. Father, we often act as rebellious children, so for all of those times that we have sinned in this past week and done what is wrong in your sight, we simply ask that you would forgive us. At this time, let us silently acknowledge our sins and confess them to the Lord. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your forgiveness, and we claim those words of assurance of pardon from your word, that though our sins be as scarlet, you wash them whiter than snow. And we thank you for that cleansing. God, today we just want to lift before you, as we always do, our nation, our state, our world, our church community. Lord, with many needs out there, we just come to you and we, we cry out to you and just pray, Lord, that you would be meeting those needs according to your will and your way. Particularly, Heavenly Father, in this society where we see growing self-centeredness and, and bitterness and, and people that just do not have a desire to follow your will or your way my heavens lord we need to be the church that shows the way people need to see jesus through us i pray heavenly father through your holy spirit speaking to this world right now and through our example that many will see there is a better way lord on that note we pray for your church and we pray for those that are outside of your church that soon that they would come to make that full and complete profession of faith in you, surrendering their lives to the Lord Jesus. At this time, let's lift to the Lord the names of people who need Jesus as their Savior and Lord, as far as we know. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, and we just look forward to hearing reports of, of the seeds being planted, of, of people coming to Jesus. What a special thing that would be. But Lord, beyond the condition of this world, we know even amongst our own fellowship, there are those that are crying out to you for help at this time. Lord, we pray for individuals everywhere that have needs. We pray today, Lord, for people like Carrie Ensminger and Kay Liddick, and for Mark Ensminger as well. Also, Lord, we pray for others today, and we, we hear the, the story of others, Lord, who have a, a physical need of some sort. Even this morning it was reported, Lord, and we just pray for those individuals, even if we don't name them, you know who they are, for your healing to be in their life. Lord, we would pray as well for those that are seeking wisdom and a decision. We pray for spiritual growth, for those who claim the name of Jesus, that everywhere around your world we would grow stronger in you. We pray, Lord, for us to be people of peace in this world, in this nation, where there's so much bitterness and angst. Father, we know it's blessed to be a peacemaker. And Lord, for the many other needs and things that are going on right now that we don't even know about, we're just going to put them into your hand and ask you to take care of them and trust that you will weave it all together in this beautiful tapestry of your plan. Lord, we would also pray today for the safety of those who protect the streets, and the police officers, and those that protect the borders and the military, and those, Heavenly Father, on the front lines of the healthcare industry as well. Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen them. And Lord, I just pray that we would not take them for granted. Lord, we would ask now that you would grant our church the grace to continue on to doing your will, Lord. Keep us from going off track, even a half of a degree, but to keep on that way of serving you, of loving you, of being that lighthouse of God to guide people to salvation and prepare people to face the storms of life. 
We pray now, Lord, as we look to your word, that your word will challenge and equip us and encourage us and help us to be the kinds of people that you would call us to be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you happen to know that even though it's 2021, you have the opportunity to watch the Olympics, 2020 Olympics, live still? Now, how can that be? Well, you probably know it's because last summer, due to the pandemic, they were canceled. So the 2020 Olympics are going to happen this summer in Tokyo in 2021. You get to watch them. And of course, as you know, many of the events in those Olympic Games include a relay race and you've seen these things before it's where one guy is running down the track and he's carrying this thing that looks like this it's called a baton right and then when he reaches his point where he's to pass the baton off to the next runner he does exactly that and then the other guy keeps running in the race and this happens in succession runner after runner after runner you pass the baton well, you may recall last Sunday as we kicked off our series, Are These the Days of Elisha? That we looked at a story where Elijah appeared to pass the baton on to the person he was mentoring, the man he was discipling, Elisha. He took his mantle, his cloak, the symbol of his prophetic ministry, and he just hands it off, throws it on to Elisha. But to be honest with you, that's not where the story ends. Elisha keeps hold of that ministry. He keeps hold of that cloak. It's almost like these guys are doing a relay race, Elijah to Elisha, whereby Elijah is running with the baton. He has it. And then he lets Elisha hold on to it. And both of these guys are running down the track together. And then finally today, we're going to see that the baton is handed off totally and completely to Elisha. Now, why is that, that they both keep hold of the baton, so to speak? Well, it's because Elijah is mentoring or discipling Elisha. And I'm convinced that when it comes to running the race of faith, as one person in one generation prepares to hand the baton off to the next generation, the best way that can happen is if they both are hanging on to it together for a while where one is discipling, one is mentoring the other, that is God's way. The ideal spiritual leader is one who is trained and mentored, and that's what we're going to look at today. Let's review from last Sunday, and by the way, this message may sound different than one that I normally give because it's very hard in this message by the nature of the story to put it in a nice little neat categories. So this might seem more like a story this morning, and I hope that's okay with you. But do you remember last week that Elijah and Elisha were at this point where it was time to pass the ministry on? And as I mentioned earlier, Elijah takes his mantle, his cloak, the symbol of his ministry, and he throws it on to Elisha as a way to say, you are going to be Israel's next prophet. The torch is being passed. It's going to happen. But God's not done with Elijah yet. Because if you read between last week's story and today's, he's still doing some amazing things through Elijah. Not ready for him to let go of that baton yet. But today, let's see how that baton is passed on by looking at 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. We're going to invite you now to turn there in your Bibles. Or you may find it in the Pew Bibles if you're here in the sanctuary on page 362. Or call it up on your phone or your tablet. 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 1 through 14. Let's begin this wonderful story in verse 1. It says, Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind... Yes, you read that right. That's going to happen. <laughs> Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. 
And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elijah, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophet who were at Jericho drew, new, drew near pardon me, to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as yourself, you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak, and he rolled it up, and he struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you, before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went, up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. There he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. And there ends the lesson. So it's time for the final part of this transition in verse 1. You read it. Yep. Elijah is going to be taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. Wow. What a way to go. And Elijah and Elisha were traveling at this time as we read this information. And we see that they're coming from Gilgal. Now we need to take particular attention to the four places, including Gilgal, where these guys are traveling around, because places remind us of things, especially special places, right? If I mention some places like, well, Orlando, Florida, what do you think of? Fun, Disney World, Universal Studios, right? How about Seattle, Washington? Oh, rain like we had earlier. Big tech, lots of things going on there. What about Hershey, Pennsylvania, the sweetest place on earth? Or maybe Washington, D.C., center of power and government and lots of crooks. Just had to say that. These places remind us of things, and these cities that we read of in Scripture, they remind us about things about God. What about Gilgal, where they're traveling from here in verse 1? Gilgal was the place... That when God's people went from the wilderness across the river into the promised land, they first camped at Gilgal. So Gilgal represents to us a new way of being, a new place to live, a brand new house, if you will, a brand new place. And then they're moving on from there because Elijah says, okay, Elisha, you can stay now. You stay, verse 2. I'm going to move on to Bethel. And what does Elisha say? He says, oh no, I'm going with you. Now what's significant about Bethel? Well, Bethel, if we look back earlier in the scriptures, that was a place where the patriarch Jacob had an amazing dream. And he dreamt where he saw God himself, the Lord, up at the top of a stairway in heaven. And he felt the presence of God. And so he called the place Bethel, which means house of God. This city reminds us of being in the presence of God. 
There's no way, even though Elijah said, you can stay here, Elisha, no way. He is going to go with his master, with the one who is mentoring him. In verse 3, by the way, he shows a lot of respect for his master. Apparently, there's a school of prophets there, a young prophet wannabes that are learning the word of God. Maybe that school was even set up by Elijah himself. We don't know. But these guys are curious, and they go up to Elijah and said, Have you heard the word that your master, Elijah, is going to be taken up in a whirlwind? Boy, news must have spread about that. No internet, no newspapers, but everybody knew about this whirlwind thing, how Elijah was going to go. And what does Elisha say? Keep quiet. I think he's showing respect for his mentor. Let's not make a big deal out of this. You just keep quiet. Same thing basically happens now as they move on to the third place, Jericho. Again, Elijah says, I'm going to go to Jericho. Elisha, you just stay here. No way. I'm going to go with you, says Elisha. What does Jericho represent to us? Well, it represents a place of God's power. Remember Jericho? You know that old song where the walls came tumbling down? God's people had a great victory against that wicked city because miraculously the walls just caved in, just came down through the power of God. No dynamite, no wrecking ball. God just did it. Those walls were out of the way and the people could do their thing according to God's will. Reminding us of the power of God. Elisha is going to be there with Elijah. He's not sitting back. And guess what? Once again, school of the prophets there, those young prophet wannabes, and they're, Elisha, do you know what's going to happen with your master? And Elisha gets, just keep quiet about it. Man, these young prophets are excited about what's going on. But yet Elisha knows to show respect for his elder mentor. Now, verses 6 and 7, we're going to the fourth place, and I beg your pardon, I said four cities, four places. This last place isn't a city, it's a river. They're going to the Jordan River. What does that represent to us? Well, it represents to us the final transition, a brand new beginning. You remember the story when God's people came out of the wilderness and were ready to step into the promised land. The barrier was there of the Jordan River. But what did God do? He did a miracle, the book of Joshua tells us, that the river Jordan parted and everybody was able to walk over on dry land and go into their new estate. The Jordan River, a place of transition. But once again, Elijah, verses 6 and 7, he's willing to go there alone. Elisha, you just stay here, but no way. Elisha, Elisha excuse me, is going to go along with his mentor. He is going to be with him each step of the way. Why do you think each of these times Elijah said, Elisha, you don't have to go with me. Stay here. And each time Elisha says, I'm going with you. I wonder if it's a test. I can't say that for sure, but I wonder if it's, are you really willing to go with me all the way? You don't need to, but Elisha has proved he is ready. And now here they are at the Jordan River. There's going to be some kind of transition. Some kind of new estate is coming here. What is going to happen? Well, first of all, God is going to show his power one more time through the old guy, through the mentor, through Elijah. Something amazing is about to happen. And oh boy, according to verse 7, those prophet wannabes, those guys in the school of prophet, the sons of the prophets... They're watching carefully. What happens? Well, God demonstrates his power, according to verse 8, through Elijah. When Elijah takes his cloak, that symbol of his prophetic ministry, and he just takes it, the baton, if you will, and he strikes the river Jordan. And what happens? The river parts. It's possible now for these two to make their way and cross over the river together. God did it by a miracle. Hey, this symbol of striking the waters and the waters parting, it's significant. Do you remember when God's people came out of slavery in Egypt? What barrier did they face that they couldn't move on to where they were going? The Red Sea. And what does God do? Through a miracle, through his servant Moses, the Red Sea is parted and everybody gets through. 
Then they're wandering in their sinful state in the wilderness for many, many years. But just at the time, again, when it's time to go into the promised land, what happens? There at that barrier, the Jordan River, the waters part by miracle of God, and the people are able to go through. So these bodies of water represent to us challenges and how God just gets rid of those challenges, makes a way so that the transition can occur. In this case, from the mentor to the apprentice, out with the old, in with the new, it is going to happen. The waters are parted. So according to verses 9 through 10, as they make that transition, as they cross over from one side of the river to the other, as this new estate begins where Elijah is about to pass off the baton to pass off his prophetic ministry to Elisha, he says to him, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? What do you want me to give you? How can I help you? And Elisha says something there that maybe you think sounds kind of greedy. It's right there in the ninth verse. He says, please give me a double portion of your spirit. Whoa, time out. What's he saying there? Is he trying to say, tell you what, Elijah, if you were this good, I want to be doubly good. If you did a thousand miracles by the power of God, I want to do two thousand miracles. I want to be twice as good as you. I want to be a big shot. Is that what he is asking for here? Not at all. If we look back in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 17, we'll find out that the phrase double portion is very significant in Scripture. The firstborn son, the one who was to be the successor, if you will, to a father was always given a double portion as a symbol that he was, or a sign that he was indeed the firstborn son. He was the one that had the rights to all of the inheritance of his father. So really what Elisha was asking for here was to have all of the rights and all of the privileges, if you will, to be able to do the ministry exactly as Elijah did as his firstborn spiritual son. That's all he wants. There is nothing greedy. There is nothing here that would make us think that Elisha is trying to be better than Elijah. Not at all. And so how does Elijah respond to this request in verse 10? He says, well, tell you what, if you see me taken away, you get your request. If you don't see me, you're not getting your request. Was Elijah playing games? I don't think so. I think Elijah knew that for him to pass that ministry on, that baton on to Elisha, it really wasn't his decision because he's not the one that called Elisha. God did. And so it was up to God. So if Elijah happened to see this miracle take place, the job was definitely his. If not, then it wouldn't be. And Elijah warns his mentee, his disciple, if you will, you've asked for a very, very hard thing. Being Israel's chief prophet is not like having a government job where you sit behind a desk, put your legs up, shuffle papers, you get an hour break working 8.30 to 4.30 every day, and you get the big bucks. He's going to have a hard life. But you know what? I don't think that matters to Elisha. Because no matter who you are, whether you are called to be Israel's prophet or you are called to be a teacher in God's church today or to encourage your neighbor by helping them or giving them a kind word or cutting their grass or being a greeter Sunday mornings at church, no matter what it is in kingdom work, if God gives you that calling, you are going to want it even if it is a hard job because it's a calling and that calling will not go away and you're going to want it like someone would want a pearl of great price. And I'm referring to that parable that Jesus told. If you're called, you're going to want to do it. Well, guess what? Now it's time for the baton to be passed in verses 11 through 14. Chariots of fire show up. And Elijah is miraculously taken up, according to verse 12, in a whirlwind, and he goes up into heaven. And that's a way to go, isn't it? We only read of two other people alive going up to heaven. We have Enoch and then the Lord Jesus, of course, after he resurrected. 
What a way to go. And Elijah, even though, Elisha, excuse me, get those guys mixed up. Even though this torch is now being passed, the, the baton has been passed, the mantle goes from Elijah to Elijah and Elisha. Now Elisha, it appears, is going to take that baton, at least we think so, because he did see it happen. What does he do? He says, my father, my father, and he tears his clothes in a sign of grief because he has so much respect for his mentor. He appreciates the one who has trained him. But now Elijah is gone, and Elisha is all alone, and it appears that he has the job now. Verse 13, Elijah's cloak falls off of him and falls down to Elisha. No, it doesn't say that Elijah took it off. It says it fell off of him. It appears that God is up to something here. God makes that cloak fall down to Elisha. But did he receive the double portion? Does he really have the cloak? Does he really have the baton now? Well, the proof is in the pudding, as we say. Verse 14, Elisha goes to the Jordan River, and he takes Elijah's cloak, that symbol of the ministry, that baton, and he strikes the river and says, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where is he? You might think, is he questioning God? Not at all. He's crying out for the power of God. You see, Elijah knows the truth that we see in 2 Corinthians 3, 5 that says, Not that we are sufficient in of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Where's the God of Elijah? God, do I have the double portion? Are you going to do the miracle? Do I have that prophetic office? And guess what? The waters part and Elisha crosses over. Yep, it finally happened. Out with the old, in with the new, the mentor is gone, the disciple now has the baton, he has the cloak, and he's going to move forward serving God. What a story. What a wonderful story. What a blessed way to think about the torch being passed from one generation to the next, from a discipler to a disciple. Now, you might be saying, why do we need to hear this here today? What does this have to do about two prophets thousands of years ago? As I reminded you last week, Jesus Christ has made the promise, I will establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's a promise. And for that to happen, for the church to continue on, guess what? The baton needs to be passed from one generation where that generation helps the next generation hold on to it for a while, mentors them, disciples that, and eventually the next generation has the mantle, has the cloak, has the baton. So for those who are going to be transitioning out, for those of us here that are doing the ministry now and are holding the baton, when we see Elisha's come along, we need to be willing to hold the baton with them and eventually pass it on. We cannot be jealous of the Elishas that God may be raising up. We can't be too stubborn or too lazy to walk with them and train them. We need to be willing to show them the way. This is the biblical model. Titus chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 makes this very clear that this is the way that it needs to be. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in the faith, in love and steadfastness. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to too much wine. They are to teach what is good and train the young women so that they're to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled. It goes on and on and on. A model here of one group of people showing the way to the next, passing on that baton. And I would say to the Elishas out there, and I don't see maybe too many Elishas here this morning, but if you see an Elisha, you remind them that the kingdom of God is worth it. That if they're feeling that calling, they need to grab on to that baton. They need to take on that ministry because the calling is not going to go away. And the calling is worth it. 
There are too many voices out there today for the Elishas, and I'm talking about the smarty pants people on places like Comedy Central, or the people that are so-called secular social justice warriors who claim to love justice but they hate Jesus Christ, people on TikTok and Snapchat that are deconverting by renouncing their faith in Jesus. Lots of bad examples are out there for the new Elishas that God may be calling. That's why we need to walk with them. We need to be their mentors. We, who are the Elijahs here, we're the cool people. We're the ones that need to walk with them and show them the way. And all those other so-called mentors and examples they have out there, they're not the ones. And they're not the ones that God would have the Elishas to follow. So my hope and my prayer is this, that we will go forward as the people of God, willing to either be an Elijah or an Elisha, and to walk together, God is going to continue to bless his church. But to do it, he's going to have to raise up some Elishas, some new spiritual leaders. And those of us that are leading now, we have to be willing to show the way so that they eventually can take on the baton. May it be so, out with the old and in with the new, in God's way and in God's time. Amen. Let's stand to sing our closing hymn, number 597. Let my, take my life and let it be. <clears throat>
Yes, indeed. Whether we're the Elijah or the Elisha, it's not about us. It's all about God, and it's about us working together for his glory. That's what it's all about. Let's go forth and serve the Lord in this way. Will you now receive the benediction? God, I thank you for so many that you've called to serve you over the years. And I thank you for those that you are raising up. And maybe we don't always see them or we know, don't know that they're there, but we believe they are. And Lord, I just pray that um, as your church moves forward, even in these times where we hear from the secular world such bad news, give us hope, Heavenly Father, that you are on the throne. You have a plan. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He has his church established and everything ultimately is going to be just fine. May we follow you as you have called us to do, mentor or mentee, discipler or disciple. May we follow you all of our days. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you do serve as a teacher, we'll remind you to get your gift if you're here in the sanctuary out in the living room. And we want to thank those of you that joined us here in the sanctuary today, also those of you that are listening out in the parking lot, and for those of you that joined us at home, it was a blessing to have you as well. This concludes this service.